Hello friends, my name is Mel and I'm an illustrator and storyteller from Melbourne, Australia. I'm also the real life person behind Maud of Moss Forest. Today, I'll be taking you on a little journey through my latest series of work. Chapter 36 was a collection of paintings I made to commemorate 36 trips around the sun. It's an exploration of some big things I've learned on my journey. It's also a tribute to some little things that I notice and appreciate. Things that add magic to my days. As I was finishing up this series and preparing my return to filmmaking, my lovely community on Instagram asked to know more about me. I thought this Q&A would be the perfect opportunity to share more about who I am as a person, as well as to give further insight to the themes in this series. Huge thanks to all who asked such thoughtful and interesting questions. Many of you make things yourselves, and it is both a joy to share the internet and make these films for you. I hope you'll enjoy watching these paintings come to life. I also hope you'll find these questions useful or comforting on your own creative journey. Why don't you make yourself a cup of something warm and fragrant and pop me on in the background while you tend to your own universe. Lastly, I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you have something to add to the conversation, please feel welcome. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Sophie McPike is here to get us started. She asks, what is the story of Maud of Moss Forest and how did you get here? I got here by a long and twisty road. Maud of Moss Forest came to me as a phrase first. Moss Forest is both the universe that I'm building as I go and also an alternate reality, much like Alice's looking glass. Maud initially took shape as a witchling living in a little wooden cottage on the edge of a pine forest. She had a mullet, freckles, a deep velvet green dress and a calico cat called Melvin. I had extremely ambitious plans to turn her into a graphic novel or a comic series until I realised I neither wanted nor cared enough to acquire all of the necessary skills for sequential art. Maud isn't so different from Mel. I do like M words. I think they're friendly. I'm fond of words in general. Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost never fails to make me shiver. It's because of him I'm obsessed with the way words sound. I write to pay homage to writers who, with nothing more than words, can take us somewhere else entirely. Of all M names, Maud, because of the way she sounds when spoken aloud, the soft and sleepy M, the dull D at the end, a single syllable name. Say it in a forest softly enough, you might not hear it. Maud because it recalls a certain Lucy Maud, creator of an Anne who lived in her head. Maud for fond memories of Mildred Hubble's loyal best friend in The Worst Witch. In many ways, Maud is me because I've never been very good at creating things I don't care deeply about. Maud is also a little bit of each of us. I don't know exactly what or who she will be in future. At the moment, she's an omniscient feminine steward of Moss Forest. Whoever she is or becomes, I hope she makes you feel seen and celebrated. I hope she illuminates the magic inside of you and shows you what's possible. Moss Forest became an escape for me in a dark time. I didn't know what to do with this lovely phrase I'd come up with and the burden of all things being possible intimidated me for several years afterwards. If I'm being honest, it intimidates me still. I think Moss Forest came to me as a glimmer of hope at a time when I was asking the universe for a sign about whether I was even meant to be an artist. I think Moss Forest came to keep me company when I was lost. I'm happy to tell you friends, I don't feel lost anymore. Now I treat what I don't know as a puzzle. I can't solve it till I've spent time in the forest, noticing, foraging, and earning the right to know those secrets, building a visual vocabulary of my own. Sometimes the unknown is just a new beginning in disguise. I can't wait to get to know and share more of Moss Forest and all her secrets. The Rose Jan wants to know your inspiration. 
So the short answer is everything. <laughs> Artistic influences include classic fairy tale illustrators Anne and Janet Graham Johnson, Sheila Beckett, Arthur Rackham, and Kay Nielsen. I love the tiny crosshatch oil paintings of Remedios Varo, the gnarly gnomes and dragons of Wayne Anderson, fairy artists Cicely Mary Barker and Shirley Barber. Fun fact, I taught her granddaughter, who arranged for Shirley to sign a book for me. I cried. I adore everything Rebecca Green, Annette Marnat, Sibylline Menet, and Vanessa Gillings create. John William Waterhouse makes me feel weak need. If this was Project Runway, there'd undoubtedly be comments made about my questionable taste, because the things that really get me excited are 80s toy lines. Polly Pocket, Rainbow Bright, Strawberry Shortcake and Lady Lovelylocks concept art to me are peak aesthetic. Thematically, I love mythology, Slavic and Greco-Roman especially. I love the darkness of traditional fairy tales. I love stories about cunning fairy folk and stories about the girl who saves herself. I love toast, being comfy, the sound a pencil makes on grainy paper gelati sunsets, gaudy socks, and the smell of fresh brownies. I am unapologetic in my love for flowers. All of them are friends, but daisies and roses especially. I love board games, Lego, and luxurious afternoon naps with my dogs. Full moons make me believe in something bigger than you and me. Passionate people, full stop. People who ask lots of questions and want to problem solve their own answers. The history of objects, the thrill of thrift shopping, of getting lost in books, of being awake very early in the morning when the rest of the world is asleep. The common thread in my work is the celebration of the quiet moment. As an introvert, I find a lot of comfort and magic in mundane things. Washing the dishes is a chore, yes, but it's also an opportunity for pause, for daydreaming for thinking up all the things I will draw next. Is it an epic battle between pirate ships? A storm brought on by siren song? Everything can be the kernel of something if we're willing to look for it. Do it often enough and nothing ordinary is boring anymore. Misia Illustrator asks, do you think an art community is important to the artist experience? Emphatically, yes. Almost all of my closest friends are either independent artists, designers, or what I'd broadly describe as colourful people. The buzz of collective creativity has been enormously motivating in my journey as an artist. I think maintaining a community that has purpose, authenticity, and creates genuine connections is a responsibility we all share. In my experience, what we get out of our community is very much a result of what and how we put in. Sometimes the most powerful thing we can do is create the work we're meant to create and be an example. I think being surrounded by other passionate creators is a power we can harness to motivate and inspire us. Others' success shows there's room for me too. It means I have intelligent and accomplished people to inspire me and collaborate with. These ideas are best expressed by Anne Friedman and Amina Tausau in their development of Shine Theory that I don't shine if you don't shine. I'll pop a link in the show notes if you fancy a tumble down the rabbit hole. I think being a productive part of a community means parting with a degree of vanity. Attentive listening is a skill we can always work on. Putting aside our own need for approval or attention, asking thoughtful questions of each other, actually listening and doing our best not to centre ourselves in every response. Most humans are equal parts ego and equal parts just wanting to know that they're loved and accepted. It's cool to be curious and it's cool to be kind. I actively spend time reaching out to others whose work I admire, and I think a willingness to be open to offer something useful or kind before asking for their company or actively seeking their friendship has served me well. In a world of instant gratification, time is our most valuable currency. 
realizing that my time is no more or less valuable than another's has allowed me to move through the world with more generosity and confidence. Expressing love or admiration for something someone has made is incredibly brave and whatever your best words are for expressing that, if you do that for others and mean it, I think that's really cool. Sophie McPike asks, how important is a space to create and feel safe in to you? I was raised as an only child surrounded by adults. I learned to be resourceful with my own company. I loved learning and I realized pretty early on that my imagination could take me anywhere I wanted to go. I could use the worlds I explored in books and movies as a starting point and embellish or redecorate them to suit my tastes. I don't understand boredom. The few times in my life I've been bored is when I've been held captive in meetings with no opportunity to move around or use my hands. Movement for me is a conduit to my creativity. For all of these reasons, I create best in a quiet environment with minimal stimulus. I'm a slow creator and need to immerse myself in a world. I need to fully understand it in my head before exploring it on paper. Being in a quiet space gives my thoughts the freedom to move. I have my own little room in a wonky little cottage in Melbourne. It is an enormous privilege to have this space and it is my favourite place in the entire world. I do my best to keep it as clean as possible because I notice the state of my desk has an impact on my mental state and my brain is cluttered enough with useless information. I fight a losing battle against my maximalist tendencies, so I try to rehome any beautiful or still useful belongings that no longer spark joy. Surrounding myself with a collection of only my favorite things makes the space feel very cozy. I also have three pets who routinely visit me and subsequently bless my lap and most surfaces with a light dusting of dog or cat hair. Nothing in my space is perfect or valuable, but everything tells a little story about a life being well used or loved. The next questions are all general questions about career pathways, tools and techniques, and I wanted to pop in a gentle disclaimer before I answer them. Firstly, I'm grateful you trust me and my opinion enough to ask. In fairness to you, my friends, I want to be clear about how I mean to move this channel forward. I'm reticent to imply I'm any kind of authority on the ways and means art can be made. I was an art teacher for 10 years and it is a full-time pursuit, being a responsible and compassionate steward for the learning of others. When I was teaching, I had to put my own creativity on the back burner. I'm enormously proud of the work we did together, my students and I, and they have inspired me in ways they will probably never know. Now I'm at a new chapter in my journey and Moss Forest needs my full attention. For this reason, my films will always prioritize storytelling within this universe. I choose now to teach by example. If you take anything away from my videos, I hope it is a sense of curiosity and inspiration for your own work and accompanying research. There are already many excellent creators whose focus it is to responsibly test or review products and show step-by-step -step processes, and I'd recommend spending time researching them. I'll pop a few of my faves in the show notes as a starting point for you. Next, Sarah Connor Ceramics wants a supply haul or showing your fave art supplies. Coraline Caroline also wants to know more about Stuff like your fave papers. I love all of my art materials. They remind me that art is artifice. It's all made up and therefore we can make anything we want. I've taken time to really commit to specific materials, to write out and problem solve the particular challenges associated with them, to play them in such a way that they sing for me and my skill set most harmoniously. I choose these because they are so quietly and deliciously tactile. They connect me to the physical world and remind me that I am human. 
I want to make very clear that none of these materials makes me necessarily a better artist, though they do enhance my experience. Any art supplies I use on a YouTube film are always listed in the show notes. If you're ever watching one of my videos and it's not immediately obvious, go check there. Here's a brief rundown to get you started on your own research. Caran d'Ache are my favorite color pencils. They are oil-based, buttery soft, have excellent color payoff and are light fast. I also use Faber-Castell Polychromos pencils. These are less soft than the Pablos and I tend to use them mostly for top layers and more graphic elements. I love the painterly look of wet mediums, but mixing is not a skill I have or care to improve. I use Copic alcohol markers in ready-made colors to achieve a soft washy underpainting. Having this sit under color pencil work also knocks back some of the grainy texture of the pencil and the paper. The Fabriano Academia drawing and watercolor pad in 240 GSM is my favorite paper. This weight and grain can withstand some of the punishment from the pencils and the texture and subsequent appearance feels very much like a vintage book. This helps me achieve a nostalgic mood in my work. Everything I create with is intentional for two reasons. It sparks joy and a continuing enthusiasm to keep making art with those mediums and or it has a look that fits my brand and my messaging. For full transparency, all of the materials I use are on the expensive end of the spectrum. I bought most of my bigger sets when I had more expendable income on a full-time teacher's wage. Not everyone has this sort of budget available to them. My very broad advice is buy the best you can afford, but please not before you've read multiple reviews and tested them out yourself. As a general indicator of whether a medium is worth your money, student grade in painting and drawing supplies means the binders that hold the pigments together are weaker. As a result, you'll generally have to work harder to get consistent results from them. They also won't have the archival properties of artist grade materials, for example, light fastness. If you do have some money to spend on art supplies, there's a wealth of written reviews on places like Amazon, as well as comparative YouTube reviews. Read and watch them, but buy from local independent stores. Before committing to full sets of things, invest first in two or three in your favorite colors. This will teach you to get more out of less, you can develop stronger palettes that way, and you can see if that art material is really suited to you and the way you make your best art before investing. Again, on YouTube especially, please don't fall victim to consumer culture. Anything that implies you need particular pens to make the best art is elitist and unimaginative. Before buying anything, be resourceful and use what is available to you. I've made some of my best artwork with a humble biro on copier paper. Sometimes more stuff can be an unnecessary distraction when what we really need to focus on is skill acquisition and learning the fundamentals. Sarah Connor Ceramics needs to know your fave art books. This question is the perfect segue to illustrate how some artists achieve more with less. Making Comics by Scott McLeod is a favorite resource. It's full of excellent advice about effective storytelling and it's entirely in black and white. Another how-to type book I love is Still Like an Artist by Austin Kleon. Every page is an easily digestible bite-sized suggestion as to how we can make our best and most dynamic work by admiring, stealing and remixing artistic ideas widely in order to create something new. Owner of possibly my favorite username in all of the internet, Intergalactic Peach Patrol wants tips for staying patient when doing the slow gradual build up of color with pencils. Friend, I like your humor. The answer to this question is a mystery to no one more than me. I think I find a lot of comfort in repetitive tasks, 
Coloring is a rinse and repeat process for the most part and I find it soothes my busy mind. I think it also helps I'm a Capricorn because where patience leaves off, stubbornness steps in. <laughs> if you're really asking how I distract myself long enough to sit with big projects though, epic fantasy audiobooks. I love anything by Neil Gaiman, Sarah J Maas and Jeff Wheeler. Next, Kerry Tut asks, how do you make such cool texture in skin tones? I can't neatly answer this because the how is always related to the why. I could theoretically make skin tones entirely out of blues, and I did once, but it doesn't suit the aesthetic that best expresses my messages. My favorite palettes tend to use lots of reds and greens because I love the vibration of those colors against each other because green makes me feel connected to growing things, because green is the color of magic, because red is the color we are inside, because of John William Waterhouse, because of Arthur Rackham. And because of all of those things first, I mostly choose skin tones with a red bias. Texture is very largely dictated by the mediums I choose to draw with. I deliberately choose lightly textured papers reminiscent of vintage art books with separate color plates. I think this appeal to our tactile nature more easily transports my audience to a fantastical place and therefore more successfully emphasizes the stories I'm telling. Fellow color pencil enthusiast, the Rose Jan asks tips and tricks for coloring really good. And Trin loves all the things Trin loves also wants to know what pencils do you use? The colors are just so magical. The short but unsatisfying answer to all of these questions is practice, patience, and curiosity. There's no substitute for learning the fundamentals. These can be learned in any way that's accessible to you, but you do need to learn them. Pay attention to the ways the light bulb in your brain glows brightest when you're learning and try to seek out or replicate those learning environments for yourself wherever possible. For example, I am weak at lighting and I'm weak at lighting because I cannot sit with instructional resources long enough to force myself to learn that way. Just like green eggs and ham, I can't do it in a classroom. I can't do it with videos. I can't do it with books. I personally learn best by looking, appreciating and replicating. And this is a slow way of doing things. I am an incurable dork about art history. I have spent a lot of my life with books pressed up against my nose, the better to understand them. Reverse engineering is one of the most powerful problem solving skills you can learn and you should set about doing it immediately. Before you go engage someone else, before you ask Google, go sit and stare at a painting you love for five minutes. Choose a tiny section. Could you pick what colors have been used from your pencil box? If there isn't a ready-made color, which two or three colors could you layer to achieve that color? Time yourself if you need to, but training yourself to sit and mentally recreate that picture is very powerful. Sit with it. Now go test some of your theories about layering those colors. Do lots of swatches. Give yourself a set amount of time, maybe an hour, to copy that section of the painting at a small scale, maybe seven centimeters by seven centimeters. This is just one of the many exercises I've used to teach myself. Whenever I see something I like, I set about trying to replicate that. I've said before, I'm incurably curious and I find nothing more satisfying than finding things out for myself. I also watch and rewatch copious amounts of YouTube tutorials, often with the sound off. I use my observational skills to closely watch what the artist is doing and you can absolutely do the same thing with my videos. Papa Surprise wants me to share, what's your most valuable thing you've learned as an artist? I am a person who needs a certain amount of structure and pressure to thrive. Without that anchor, I will daydream my life away. Left to my own devices, I am a perfectionist. This is the face my anxiety wears. Without time constraints or clear goals, I don't truly challenge my potential. 
I think I avoid sitting with feelings of discomfort when I compare an imperfect reality to the perfect vision I have for my art. It took me many years to understand that my perfectionism can be a form of procrastination and that, more than imperfect work, holds me back. The most valuable things I've learned as an artist is that it's nobody else's responsibility to save me, discover me, teach me, or do the hard work for me, that I'm not the main character in everybody else's story. That doesn't mean I don't deserve a seat at the table, just that, like everyone else, it's my job to build the chair I sit in. These have been hard lessons to learn in the process of becoming. You know that meme about two ways to look at life and in both scenarios, nobody gives a heck? Embracing the idea that nobody is paying attention has been liberating for me. It has allowed me the space to ask, what do I really want to leave behind when my meat suit has returned to stardust again? I know that sounds grim, but for a mind that's always busy with equal amounts of possibilities and self-doubt, this is how I was best able to put what I really wanted into perspective. It allows me to prioritize, to put aside extraneous stuff, to slow down a toxic cycle of self-sabotage, to set realistic goals and make thoughtful plans to achieve them. I have spent a lot of my life feeling overwhelmed by anxiety. I am still learning strategies to make it sit down and be quiet long enough to create. Finished, not perfect, has been a guiding mantra for pushing through. Every time I do, it's one less what if that I don't have to regret later on. I'd so much rather challenge myself to do hard things and fail or find out that they're not for me than to never try and not know. Finally, Kerry Tut wants to know your favourite memory of a parent. I am fortunate to have been raised and supported by a small band of loving parent figures. At three, I remember how much is that doggy in the window an 80s keyboard piano, and Uncle Steve with a voice like Elvis. At four, I remember the illustrations of Annabelle Lee in the giant golden book, the glow of the bedside table lamp and the cadence of my Auntie Cheryl's voice as she read to me. I chose Poe for these illustrations, not really understanding the content of the words. It's interesting that years later I'd go actively seeking these delicious and tragic gothic stories that one day I'd be teaching Poe and poetry to eighth graders. At six, I shared with my Papa Bill a brand new discovery that my pets were, in fact, my brothers and sisters. A photo of him sat proudly on my grandma's mantle, a young Papa with twinkling eyes. Though the man I knew was older and frailer, those eyes were the same. In his good and gentle way, Papa laughed and told me I was right, and God bless me. At eight, I listened in when my older cousins asked Grandma about the hotel she'd owned when our own parents were children. She'd been woken, she thought, by the sound of my auntie crying. When she'd gone to investigate, she'd found not a girl in need of comfort, but a beautiful stranger in a crinoline gown. She was singing and quite, quite see-through. Grandma sensed a lot of things other people couldn't or didn't want to see. Though these stories kept me from sleep myself, I'd still ask to hear them. I learned young the thrill of a delicious shiver. Various ghosts have visited the women on that side of the family, and as everyone always told me how much I looked like Grandma, I'd be both thrilled and terrified to have inherited this family trait too. I think the ghosts stay away because I ask them to. I would, however, love a visit from Grandma. I remember so many things about my Grandma and I only miss her more keenly as time goes on. I remember the dry tickle of her nails on my back, me at her feet and her watching telly in her comfy armchair behind me. She'd laugh when I'd shiver and ask me if someone had walked over my grave. A strange phrase I still use and a sensation I experienced just hearing the sound of nails on skin. When I look down at my own hands now, I see her hands. 
I remember the stories Grandma told of rolling jaffers down the aisle of the old wooden cinema. Auntie Dulcie was her best friend and co-conspirator in this tomfoolery. Auntie would throw her head back and cackle, reenacting the surprise of fellow patrons caught in the crossfire of their loo roll missiles in the bathroom. Auntie Dulcie referred to Grandma as rare, and it was a running joke in the family that it was spelled R E A R. Grandma was happy to be the butt of jokes if it meant making people laugh. I remember the crystal that hung in her farmhouse kitchen and all the little rainbows it threw in the morning sun. I remember mandarins plucked and eaten fresh from the tree, seven at a time and sweeter than candy. I remember her sponge cake with passion fruit icing. I remember every visit came with the promise of a gift from the fairies, if I was very good. They wrote me tiny little notes and left me sweets or bars of fancy soaps that smelled of roses. If I could have an hour with her again, I'd bake her my peach tea cake and tell her how much her kindness has helped me be strong when it wasn't easy to be. I think if Grandma and I met now, I'd be honoured to be her friend. At 12 in the morning, there was a tiny gauze bag of jelly beans and sparkles, all tied up with string. In the long looping G's of my cousin's handwriting, the fairies told me they'd had a lot of fun dancing in my hair. Kylie was everything I wanted to be when I grew up. Beautiful, creative, independent. She's still everything I want to be when I grow up. She was the bright light in my school holidays. I remember going to the cinemas and choc tops and popcorn. I remember Monday nights and roast beef and watching Friends. Now that I'm meant to be a grown-up too, she's not just family. She's the friend I'd choose anyway. At 17, there was carrot cake for my birthday because Auntie Cheryl knew that that was my favourite. There was the cafe once the weekly grocery shop was done, ham and cheese muffins with impossibly yellow butter and frothy cappuccinos, very grown-up. We would laugh about my indignation as a four-year-old that Auntie refused to share her froth with me. And every year since, never a day late, there's always a card waiting for her girl on my birthday, accompanied by a very generous dollar note and firm instructions that I treat myself. When I'm cheeky, which I frequently am as an adult where I'd not have dared as a child, she cuts her eyes at me and calls me Melissa, like it's a curse word. Sometimes I'll pretend to have learned my lesson. I probably shouldn't stir the pot, but she always bites, and I'm only a little ashamed to say I'm quite proud to have contributed to the silver hairs on her head. I love you, Auntie. I am myself because of these wonderful men and women. It's for them that I share these stories. I hope I've imparted to you how good these people are, how a creative life can be shaped by perspective and by the way we tell our stories. Thank you so much for joining me today, friends. I wish you light on your path and the belief in impossible things. See you soon. <laughs>